Welcome to the Reason and Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton. Doing an impromptu show today. Got a little bit of time. Going to be talking about uh, several different topics this evening. One is Pope Leo. Of course, Pope Leo the Great. And conciliar fundamentalism. After that, we're going to talk a little bit about Vatican II and infallibility. And then we're going to dive into communion for the Orthodox in the pre-conciliar era. Some interesting information that uh, a lot of people probably don't know about. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive in. And uh, by the way, I see y'all in the chat. How are y'all? Merry Christmas. A hey, Catholic Crusader, Kyle. How are y'all? Well, uh, let's dive in first to, like I said, Pope Leo and conciliar fundamentalism. Now, what is conciliar fundamentalism? One may wonder. Well, conciliar fundamentalism is a term coined by Dr. Price. Um when he was engaging, especially the Council of Chalcedon, although he may have used the term before then. <clears throat> but to my knowledge, he's, he's the one who coined the term. I don't think anybody used it prior to him. But hey, I'm willing to be corrected. Um, we're going to have the question here in the chat. Have you read Dr. Joy's, uh, Dr. Joy's paper on Vatican II? Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to be quoting from Dr. Joy's book about Vatican II. So um, I, I haven't read a paper specifically, but I am reading his book. And, and by the way, he is going to be on the show uh, pretty soon talking about his book. So everybody, you know, stay tuned for more on that. So conciliar fundamentalism, what is it? Well, it's this idea that basically everything that an ecumenical council teaches is infallible. Now, I'm not saying an ecumenical council, you know, uh, can't teach infallibly. Of course it can. Obviously, it has many times, right? I see a one on consubstantiality of the two natures of uh, Christ, right? Well, the consubstantiality of Christ, I should say, not the two natures. <laughs> uh, jumping ahead and thinking of Chalcedon there. The consubstantiality of Christ how he is human, fully human, fully divine, but homoousios, consubstantial with the Father, of one essence with the Father. It's especially engaging his divinity, right? Later on, they'll engage its relation, his, his divine relation to the humanity at Chalcedon. Anyways, so talking about conciliar fundamentalism, it's the idea that everything in ecumenical council even those propositions that are in the acta are infallible. And notice I said propositions, right? Because, yes, I mean, I roll my eyes every time I hear it, but obviously somebody's going to point out, well, not everything in the acta is infallible because sometimes it's quoting heretics. Yes, I know that, obviously. Obviously. What, what it, the conciliar fundamentalist is saying is that all of the propositions expressed by Orthodox bishops at an ecumenical council, even if it's only in the Acta, um, are definitive. They're infallible. Okay, so that's conciliar fundamentalism. Now, <clears throat> it is true that Pope Fran I'm sorry, <laughs> did I say Pope Francis? Pope Leo, quite a... Big contrast between the two, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe I slipped it. Actually, called Pope Leo Pope Francis. Pope Leo <laughs> was somewhat of a conciliar fundamentalist. Some people may may not know that, you know, but he he actually was, in some aspects at least, because whenever he was um, asked to ratify canon 28 of chalcedon he denied it he rejected it and he did it on the basis that he believed it contradicted nicaea 
and its cannons. So yeah, we are talking about a cannon rather than the acta, sure. But he believed the taxes, the order of the bishops there that isn't really expressly clearly taught in Nicaea, uh, Canon 6, I believe. He believed that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, you know, so that the order in the taxes was Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. Again, it's not very clear, at least in the Greek version of the, uh, of the canon. But putting that issue to the side, he believed that Canon 28 of Chalcedon was not only encroaching on the authority and position of Alexandria and Antioch, but more importantly was contrary to what the Holy Spirit did at Nicaea in its canon, where you have the taxes being Rome, Alexandria, Antioch. That's a form of conciliar fundamentalism. I mean, we don't have his take on the acts. Why? Well, because Nicaea didn't have acts. At least if it did, we, we don't have a record of it, I should say. Uh, to my knowledge, I, I don't know if they actually recorded any acts offhand. I'd have to go back and look at that. But I know we don't have the acts themselves until Ephesus, in fact. That's the first time we have the acts of a council. <clears throat> so... He rejected Canon 28 because he believed in a form of conciliar fundamentalism. Why am I belaboring this point? Because the irony here is those, not all, but some who maintain orthodox fundamentalism, I'm sorry, conciliar fundamentalism, are just that. They're the Eastern Orthodox. And where's the irony? Well, it's the Eastern Orthodox who are asserting that Constantinople was second in the taxes, right? Not that Rome later on didn't accept that. I mean, obviously Rome, Rome did later on accept Constantinople as a second C. But the point is this. Those who are mostly invested in that position are the Orthodox. Although, how does that work with the current schism right now between Constantinople and Moscow? I don't know, but... Those who are mostly invested in it are the Orthodox, and yet a lot of them are conciliar fundamentalists. And the irony here is that Pope Leo is using a form of conciliar fundamentalism to reject their canon. It's, it's interesting. He actually even uses the authority of Peter himself to reject the canon. Um. But again, he's appealing to the Holy Spirit in his work at Nicaea 1. Here's actually what he says. Let me read you the quote. This is <laughs> Epistle 104 to the Emperor Marcion, May 452, so after Chalcedon, right? Notice what he says here. For the privileges of the churches determined by the canons of the Holy Fathers and fixed by the decrees of the Nicene Synod cannot be overthrown by any unscrupulous act, nor can they be disturbed by any innovation. Hmm. He's actually saying that one who maintains this canon is guilty of innovation a charge that Orthodox like to throw at Catholics often. Here it's being thrown right at them. And in the faithful execution of this task, by the aid of Christ, I am bound to display an unflinching devotion. For it is a charge entrusted to me, and it tends to my condemnation if the rules sanctioned by the fathers and drawn up under the guidance of God's Spirit at the Synod of Nicaea for the government of the whole church are violated with my convenience, uh, I'm sorry, connivance, which God forbid, and if the wishes of a single brother have more weight with me than the common good of the Lord's whole house. Saying it's God's direction that determined the taxes. So you can't change the order of the churches. Now, as Catholics, we, we don't agree with Pope Leo there. Um, Pope Leo was wrong. 
clearly. I mean, we we ended up accepting Canon 28 of Calcinon and having a different understanding of Nicaea Canon 6. And, and by the way, this wasn't, you know, just something that began with Canon 28 of Calcinon. Of course, you have 381, Constantinople 1, Canon 3, which Pope Leo has some curious comments to, to say about that canon. He seems to not be aware of it, even though we know the Roman See had been made aware of it, although not accepted at the time. Um, it had been made aware, but Pope Leo seems unaware of Canon 3, of 381, Constantinople 1. Anyways, I just find that ironic. <laughs> How many of the arguments that maybe perhaps one side uses can be thrown right back in their face. So if you hold to a form of conciliar fundamentalism, my question is, how do you deal with the change in the taxes? Now, I know there are some ways to try to get around that and say, well, technically we're not changing the order of churches. What we're saying is, then instead of the Roman See being located in just one city, its privileges are split out into two cities. But we're not changing the taxes. We're just saying that Rome and its prerogatives are really split out into two cities. <laughs> How is that not a change? I don't know. <laughs> it's clearly still a change. It's clearly still a change. Again, I'm not saying there's not a way that we as Catholics can't understand this and reconcile it and still affirm the role of the Holy Spirit at ecumenical councils. There is a way for us to do that. I'm just saying for those who would try to suggest that conciliar fundamentalism is right and yet say that there was no change here, there was no change in the taxes. Somebody's asking, what are the taxes? Not T-A-X-E-S, T-A-X-I-S. Um, the order, the order of the churches is basically what we're talking about, that there was no change in the order of, you know, which church is over another church. And we're talking about over in a very loose sense, <clears throat> which one is higher in authority, which one is more preeminent, more veneration. Well, if you honestly can say that conciliar fundamentalism is true, and there were no changes to the taxes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I can't take it seriously. I can't. There are those who would maintain that, but whatever. Again, as Catholics, I think there's a way that we could disagree with Pope Leo here. And yet still respect the work of the Holy Spirit at Nicaea 1 and subsequent ecumenical councils. With the proper distinctions, we can do that, and we don't have to fall into the error of conciliar fundamentalism. And yes, I'm calling it an error. I do believe it's an error. I don't believe it's heretical, but I do think it's erroneous. I don't believe it's tenable. Um, and I do believe it's contrary to the facts, historical facts of the councils. Okay. So, so much for Pope Leo and uh, conciliar fundamentalism. All right, let's talk about the issue of Vatican II and infallibility. And in fact, before I read the quote here from Dr. Joy, let me just kind of give you a little bit of background. You know, some are going to rightfully note that Vatican II did not infallibly dogmatize anything. And even Paul VI said that, right? And that's true. That's absolutely true. That does not mean, however, that the Second Vatican Council did not have any unique contributions that were definitive. In fact, it did. At least one. At least one. A unique contribution. And what I mean by unique here is it was the first one to make the teaching or the proposition definitive. Not that it wasn't taught before, but it, it made it definitive. It raised it to that state. 
And here I'm talking about the sacramentality of the episcopate. Prior to Vatican II, it was not definitively settled that the uh, sacramentality of the episcopate was um, fundamentally distinct from the sacramentality of the priesthood. That there was a, a fundamental degree in uh, or difference between the two orders there. There was a fundamental difference there. Well, of course, Vatican II definitively said that, yes, there is. There is. But it did it in a non-solemn um, way. It did not solemnly proclaim a new dogma, you know. It didn't just use that language of, you know, if anyone says that the, the sacramentality of the episcopate is not blah, 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 let them be anathema. We decree and define and teach it. You know, it, it doesn't do that, right? There, there's no solemn definition. But that's also not to say that it teaches that proposition with the merely authentic or merely ordinary magisterium. So, here's a quote, Dr. Joy. But the same apparent restriction of the extraordinary magisterium to properly dogmatic definitions also appears in the common tendency to conclude that the teaching of Vatican II as a whole belongs solely to the ordinary magisterium on the grounds that the council defined no new dogma. So he's saying that, you know, some hold the view that Vatican II belongs entirely to the ordinary magisterium alone. And that's going to throw some people off because they're going to say what? I thought this is an ecumenical council. Isn't that an extraordinary event? Yes, it's an extraordinary event, but not all of its teachings are extraordinary. Some of its teachings are considered ordinary. Even though it's an extraordinary event, its teachings may or may not be extraordinary. It just depends on what we're talking about. In the case of Vatican II, there are no extraordinary uh, teachings. The Second Vatican Council's teaching on the sacramentality of the episcopate is an excellent test case for the possibility of a non-dogmatic definition of the extraordinary magisterium. Inasmuch as this teaching was apparently intended to settle a question previously open to legitimate dispute. According to Dulles, who cites Congar, this teaching ranks as a definitive judgment. So it's definitive. Right? It, it, its proposition here is definitive. Yet Dulles still attributes it to the ordinary and universal magisterium. So he's attributing it on those grounds that it's definitive. On the ground that it is not a dogmatic definition in the strict sense. Similarly, according to Betty, this is not a definition in the technical sense of the word, since it would not be heresy to reject it. It is true and eh, yeah... It's not heresy to deny something that's not dogmatically defined, but if it's definitive, it's still, you're, you're not free to reject it, right? It is true that this doctrine was not proposed as a dogma of divine and Catholic faith, but if there is a definitive doctoral judgment of an ecumenical council that settles a question hitherto freely disputed by theologians, why not acknowledge it as a solemn definition of the extraordinary magisterium, unless the latter is indeed restricted to the primary object of the magisterium and so to properly dogmatic definitions, de fide credenda, to the exclusion of definitions, de fide tenenda. You know, a lot, lot going on there in the latter part. A lot could be said there, but... Um, just to summarize it here, he's saying that, yeah, some are going to note that it did not dogmatically define a dogma here, but it did definitively propose this. So just be careful, you know, before you just jump to the conclusion that, hey, everything Vatican II teaches is up for grabs. It's not <laughs> that, that's not even true at all. I mean. Even what's taught in the ordinary magisterium is not necessarily up for grabs, right? There's unique um, things that must occur. There's specific things that must occur if you're going to withhold assent from something in the ordinary magisterium. So you're not free to just reject Vatican II. But even, you know, putting that issue to the side, people tend to think, well, hey, you know, there's no dogmas here in Vatican II. So, hey, I'm, I'm free to reject it. If it's not extraordinary, it's not infallible. Hey, it's up for grabs. 
In fact, there is a definitive proposition made there. And I would say that you're still not free to reject the propositions given at Vatican II unless a previous magisterial proposition outweighs it. Obviously, you have to assent to the one with the higher weight. All right, we've talked, we, we've engaged that many, many times on this show. So I'm not going to belabor that point. But that means you're not free to just, as a Catholic, reject Vatican II and everything that it teaches that you don't like. We don't have that luxury. We simply don't. We're bound to give religious submission of intellect and will to its propositions unless it comes in conflict with the previously taught magisterial proposition with higher authority. And 99% of the time, whenever somebody has a problem with Vatican II, it's not a problem with Vatican II per se, it's a problem with the person. It's a problem with the person and their understanding, and it's a proper problem with their theology. It's generally not a problem with Vatican II. That's not to say I don't have problems with Vatican II. I do. I do. I think it could have been more clear in some cases than it was. That being said, generally, the issues are not with Vatican II. They are with the interpreter. Now, you might say, well, we shouldn't have to interpret magisterial propositions, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, hey, you look, I'm, I'm on board with you right there, right? I shouldn't. Uh, the magisterium shouldn't leave it to where I have to now interpret it. I, I agree with you, but that's been the case for 2,000 years. That's not anything new in the preconciliar, I'm sorry, postconciliar era. You're going to have that problem in the preconciliar era. Nicaea is left open to some interpretation on the um, divinity of the Holy Spirit. They deliberately passed over that issue. The creed deliberately does not address that. The creed from Nicaea does not address it explicitly. It was left open to interpretation because they knew that was a matter debated and they didn't want to engage it. Sounds pretty familiar, right? So, again, my thing is, look, I'm, I'm right there with you as far as promoting tradition I'm right there with you in fighting modernism and liberalism in the church. I'm right there with you. But what I detest is people who or it's not the people, it's more their theology, uh, is the idea that because there is all kinds of modernism and liberalism in the post-conciliar era, the Vatican II is up for grabs. <laughs> and if you just, if you think that, you haven't really thought through your um, paradigm very well, because if you have a if, if you have an ecumenical council in your paradigm that's that flawed that you can reject the whole thing, or it could make fundamental errors and even heresy, as some people accuse it of. Why are you Catholic? <laughs> Think through your paradigm better. If your church is that defectible, you need to consider some other options. Consider orthodoxy. Consider Protestantism. You, you haven't thought through your paradigm very well. Now, I'm not saying that you need to consider orthodoxy and Protestantism because uh, the ecumenical council, uh, Second Vatican Ecumenical Council is, is false. What I'm saying is, if that is your position, you really haven't thought through things very well. You're not carefully thinking through these things. What I would do is just walk it back and question the assumption that the Second Vatican Council is fundamentally flawed. That, that's where I would take it to. A lot of these people who have, uh, you know, make these claims... They've never even read the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council or any of the other documents associated with Vatican II. They've never read it, never read them. Maybe they've read, you know, little segments here and there, proof texts, but they haven't read them, the entire thing. And even if they have read the entire thing, did they understand it well? 
Again, I'm not saying there aren't things that we can criticize in Vatican II. There are. But I just, I don't take that position that is just uh, anti-Vatican II. Vatican II is the problem with everything. Vatican II helped with the problem, sure. But Vatican II is not in and of itself the problem. We had deeper problems, and I think Vat the Second Vatican Council was the occasion in which the bottom fell out, you know. I think that that's effectively what was going on. All right. So much for Vatican II and infallibility. Next thing that I wanted to talk about was the preconciliar era on the reception of Orthodox, which would include giving them communion, right? If you're receiving an Orthodox into the Catholic Church, what does that include? The sacraments of initiation, which includes what? The Eucharist, right? Yeah. So what I'm about to show you means these Orthodox converts, those who were received into the church, who were previously Orthodox, and arguably remain Orthodox, are given Holy Communion. And you're going to see why this is interesting, because we tend to think of the Second Vatican Council as having ushered in this new era where Orthodox are allowed to receive communion, and it was just, you know, everything went crazy. We dropped our guard. That might be true, but this wasn't new. This wasn't new. There are some elements to what's going on with Vatican II and the reception of Orthodox, well, I'm sorry, giving Orthodox Holy Communion. There are some new aspects to it, sure, but giving Orthodox Holy Communion, even in non-emergency situations, is not new to the pre, I'm sorry, post-conciliar era. It's not. So if you're going to try to use this as an occasion to say the Sea of Rome is vacant and, you know, here's an example. Well, we're going to have a problem with Pope Pius X now, aren't we? Hmm. I wonder why. Why? Why would I say that? Well, here's what Pope Pius X said. And he said this too. I always find it hard to pronounce the Metropolitan's name. Sheptitsky. <laughs> S-H-E-P-T-Y-T-S-K-Y. He writes a letter to him. Well, he doesn't actually pin this thing, right? But he, he says at the end, let it be considered sufficient. He gives papal approbation to this thing. Somebody else wrote it up for him. And they read it to him, and he said, yep, send it. Rome, 1908, February 17th. Uh, to the Metropolitan Administrator of the Metropolitan Sea of Kiev and of all of Russia and of blah, 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 blah. And likewise, Bishop of blah, 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 blah. Prostrate at the feet of your holiness, most humbly beg that your holiness might deign to decree that the formula for profession of faith prescribed to Urban the Eighth for those of the East returning to the Catholic unity not be required except for those who are able to understand it well. But that for others, except in cases where bad faith, that is formal schism, can be presumed. Notice the distinction between formal and material. The Niceno, uh, Niceo Constantinopolitan um, profession of faith may suffice with the addition of a brief formula of submission to the authority of the Supreme Pontiffs. Our Most Holy Father, Pope Pius X, deigned to sign the original document written by me with the words, let it be considered sufficient. So he signed off on this. It was actually a letter written, written to the Pope. He signs off on it. But notice what he's saying. Orthodox who are being received into the church, in some cases it's sufficient to receive them into the church with a mere profession in the Nicene Creed in a brief formula of submission to the Pope. Why is that important? 
Well, 1908, that means they were not required to affirm the Immaculate Conception, for example. They weren't required to affirm papal infallibility, A brief formula of submission to the authority of the Supreme Pontiffs does not necessarily include papal infallibility. But even if you want to say, well, the brief formula surely would have included that. What about the Immaculate Conception? They didn't have to accept that. Now, I'm not saying a Catholic is not bound to accept these things. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. Pope Pius X allowed them to be received into the church without formally affirming certain dogmas basically the dogmas that the catholic church has defined between the nicene creed or at least you know the first seven ecumenical councils and 1908 (laughs) with the exception of submission to the roman pontiff he did not require them to uh, make a profession in in order to be received into the church which includes communion Interesting. Very interesting. Now, when an Orthodox today receives communion, you have a similar similar situation, but not, not entirely the same, right? No brief formula of submission to the authority of the pontiff has to be given. But still, I mean, hey, it's, <laughs> it, it's substantially the same. I mean, if you don't, if there's at least one dogma that you don't have to affirm, then... What's the difference substantially, right? So, I found that very interesting. I have uh, Father Coppus to to thank for this. He sent that to me. He was you know, one who noted it on, on the show, and I asked him for it, and there it was. He was right. Pope Pius X signed off on that. So, if you're going to say that, you know, giving the Orthodox, you know, the sharing of sacred things, communis and sacrises, um, you know, you know, somehow invalidates the church or not invalidates the church, but proves that the sea is vacant, then you have to really say the same thing of Pius X because substantially you have the same argument that can be made there. Substantially. Whatever you can substantially say about the post-conciliar era with this issue, you would have to say here as well with Pius X. And hey, some are crazy enough to say that, right? (laughs) The sea's been vacant since Pius the <laughs> Tenth. I've I've heard some say as far back as I don't know, like the fourth or fifth century, the sea has been vacant or something like that. Yeah, I know those are loons, right? I mean, most set of a contest don't affirm that, but th- th- those tend to be the the cra- the real crazies, I should say. Um, th- those tend to be the the loons, but. Boy, if you really believe that, why are you still Catholic? Or at least you're not so Catholic, but why are you still trying to affirm the Catholic faith? Makes a little bit more sense to go elsewhere at that point. Your C is defective at that point. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if y'all have any questions for me, go ahead and send them. Otherwise, I'll kill the stream here in a few minutes. Uh, I think I saw some earlier. Let's see if I can go back to them. Don't Orthodox have valid sacraments from Kyle? Yes, they do have valid sacraments. Just because they have valid sacraments does not mean that everybody is receiving them who is Orthodox receiving them in grace, right? Doesn't mean that they're receiving the grace of them because, hey, there's plenty of Catholics who receive the sacraments and aren't receiving the grace because they put some impediment between them and God. So same thing exists here. If there's an impediment between the Orthodox and God, the sacraments that they're receiving are valid, but they're not receiving the graces because they're putting an impediment between them and God. What might that impediment be? Schism. Schism. I mean, that's an impediment, right? Now, if they are materially schismatic, that's not sufficient to be an impediment. But if they're formally schismatic, that is an impediment. Yes. So just because you're Orthodox doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Just because you have valid sacraments doesn't mean that you're receiving them properly. Which is why Orthodox need to become Catholic. Which is why we shouldn't just say, hey, it's okay, you got valid sacraments, stay where you're at. No, no. Because you might be formally in schism. And that's a problem for you. 
Got to get Timothy Gordon back on. He's done some great videos of Vatican II in continuity. Yeah, uh, I'll have to check those out too. <sighs> Consider set of contism. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, five a day productions. Any video or book going through the theological notes of various propositions in the Vatican II documents. In the Vatican II documents specifically, gosh, no, not that I can think of. It doesn't mean that it's not out there. It's just offhand I can't think of. Um, hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm just making sure that I'm not missing something here. I don't recall of him. Not that goes through Vatican II and discusses theological notes of its propositions. I mean, that, that sounds like a doctoral dissertation waiting to be written right there. <laughs> so, there you go. Um, yeah, send me Dr. Joy's paper. I'd love to read that. He's a phenomenal theologian. His work is phenomenal. Like I said, he's going to be back on the show. We're going to talk about his book. I'm learning a lot. It, in just 20 something pages of his book, I've made page after page after page of notes. Very, very helpful stuff. Uh, but it's like a fire hydrant reading Dr. Joy. I mean, literally every single sentence I have to, you know, <laughs> Uh, really work through because there's just so much thrown out you, at you, so many good propositions thrown out at you, good information thrown out, and it's just, man, I need to take this stuff in line by line, sentence by sentence, word by word, and really commit this to memory. Um, I know that the Roman Sea had the most authority, a special authority, the Roman popes sure thought so. Um, the formula of uh, Hermisdus sure claimed that. The Eastern bishops designed off on it sure thought that. Pope Agatho's letter to the Sixth uh, Ecumenical Council sure seems that way. Pope Leo sure thought that. <laughs> we, we can go on and on and on. Um, there are numerous popes who maintained a view of the papacy that Orthodox would have to claim is heretical and they're saints in the Orthodox church. You know, it's not like, you know, maybe one or two said a couple things that are false here and there. Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope in the first millennium taught the claims that Rome uh, makes today, effectively, implicitly, in uh, seed format, whatever you want to call it, sometimes fully blown, just depends on what we're talking about, but they taught it substantially, and they're saints in the Orthodox Church. I think that's a, one of the biggest blows to Eastern Orthodoxy. I don't know how to consistently maintain the first seven ecumenical councils and remain orthodox. You know, when I was received into the Orthodox, I had to make a profession in the first seven ecumenical councils and to affirm everything they taught. But some of the things they taught in the Acts about the papacy, I don't think you can maintain as an Orthodox. I don't see it. I don't see it. And if, and if you found some kind of way to... Uh, make it work. You're not in Lee. You're here. You're not backed by almost every one of your bishops. So, I mean, <laughs> you're not by backed by the letter of the four patriarchs, which sees Peter as having no, no distinction between Peter and the other apostles. And even less in his successors, as they say, <laughs> You're just completely at odds. You're out of step. You're 10 steps out of step with your own church. So I, I don't see that. I don't see it. If I'm going to take the first seven ecumenical councils seriously, I have to conclude the papacy. 
the Catholic version of the papacy. So, yeah, uh, I think this is a major problem there. Because you're right, the popes do claim a special authority. See if there was anything else. Uh, let's see. I'm looking, y'all. Are there many Eastern contemporaries that rejected formula of Hermistus? Uh, I guess, are you asking, um, like, contemporaries to Pope Hermistus or contemporaries, like, for us? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, if if you mean contemporary for Hermistus, I think that all of them signed off, all of the Eastern bishops signed off on it. I'm 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 not aware who, of who didn't. Uh, if any of them didn't sign off and uh, remained in schism, that that may be the case. But I'm, I'm just offhand not aware of any. Um, for them to come back into communion, they had to sign off on this. I don't think that you could square that circle and try to say, well, but we can still maintain this in an orthodox way and I've seen attempts to do that and I I don't see it working uh, do the orthodox consider all the acts of a council infallible some do and some don't some are conciliar fundamentalists some are not just because you're orthodox doesn't mean you have to be a conciliar fundamentalist some are and some aren't um, Metropolitan Hilarion isn't Wrote a whole paper showing why he isn't. I think he was compelling in a few points. But of course, the Orthobros will say, well, he's a heretic. <laughs> okay. All right. He's liberal. Anything you don't agree with, it, it, they're a liberal, they're a heretic. Um,. But those who are conciliar fundamentalists would consider all of the acts of the ecumenical councils, the first seven ecumenical councils at least, as infallible, yes. Not the parts where the heretics are speaking, though. Obviously. Because somebody will try to interject that as if they're contributing something insightful to this conversation and I have to just roll my eyes. Uh, okay. Where in the first seven councils is it said that the Pope of Rome stands above an ecumenical council? I would ask better questions than that. I would ask better questions. What do the first seven ecumenical councils say that would lend to Catholic ecclesiology for the papacy rather than orthodoxy? That's a better question. Um, <clears throat> now, did Pope Leo think that he was over an ecumenical council in receiving uh, the new taxes, the new order of bishops? You'll say, well, you know, all the patriarchs had to sign off on it. But... He sure thought that he had a unique role in signing off on it. He sure thought he had a unique authority in signing off on it. He sure thought that though they, the other bishops in the East, affirmed it, he thought that he had the authority to reject it and put all of them to rest and reject what they have accepted. Is that a pope being over an ecumenical council? You tell me. What do you make of that? Um, reason of theology. What do you say to the argument that Peter's authority wasn't specific to the Bishop of Rome, but all bishops along the lines of St. Cyprian? Right. I heard it a million times. Or the claim that, you know, Petrine prerogatives are... Or, you know, all of the Petrine Seas. There's some truth to that, right? Every, every bishop, P 
Peter, if you will, is working through every bishop. Every bishop is a Peter in their diocese, in a sense. There's some truth to that. There's some truth to the notion that all three of the Petrine Seas have an even more unique claim to Peter. And yet, there's another sense in which the Bishop of Rome can claim Petrine authority in a unique sense that the others can't. And in fact, he did. So in spite of those claims, the bishops of Rome still would tend to claim a unique way in which they are the successor of the Apostle Peter in a way in which the other bishops aren't. Even though, in in a sense, they might be, sure, but not in the sense that the Pope is claiming to be. And not with all of the privileges that the Pope is maintaining. So, and you can find in the East several times in which they affirm that. And they affirm he has unique prerogatives that I would say substantially leads to Vatican I. It leads to that. Uh, Patrick asks, how is submission to the Roman pontiff a a necessity? I'm sorry, I need to get some glasses or something. Necessity, my monitor is really far. (laughs) Necessity in the text is really small. Necessity for salvation, unum sanctum. If different saints recognize different popes during Western schisms. Yeah. Because what's being said is that if you're formally rejecting a pope, right? as opposed to material rejection where you're, you're just unaware of who's the correct Pope and it's some kind of unique crisis or something. You're not formally rejecting something the Pope teaches. You're just mistaken in who your understanding of the Pope is. But if you know who the Pope is, sufficiently know, and you then reject what he teaches definitively, then yes, This is now impeding your salvation. So, that's a quick answer. In your opinion, do you believe the distinction between Matthew 16, 18 and Matthew 18, 18 proves papal primacy? Right, yeah, look, this has been discussed by the fathers themselves. Right, read read the fathers themselves. Read St. Optatus. Um... You know, there, there are fathers who, who speak about this and they know that, yes, binding and loosing is something given to all of the apostles and by extension to all the bishops. But the keys was something that was singled out for Peter. But... We can also say that the other bishops have, I'm sorry, the other apostles and by extension, the other bishops, right, have hold the keys. We can say that, but they hold the keys through Peter. Peter gives them the keys, if you will. Christ gives it to them through Peter. Peter has given them in a unique way in which the other apostles and bishops are not given the keys in in that way. They're given the keys, but not in that unique way. So in, in what sense are we talking about, you know, possessing the keys? Because in a very loose sense, I mean, the, the priests maintain the keys. According to origin, even the laity do. I mean, so in unique senses, one can possess the keys. But um, in another sense, there might be something that's unique to um, the Pope. So hope that helps answer uh, your question there. I would say yes. Yes, there is a distinction there. I think that distinction is important to note. And that distinction carries over from the uh, College of the Apostles, where Peter is the head, to the College of Bishops, where the Pope is the head. So, to the extent and in the sense, 
in which Peter held the keys in a way that the other apostles didn't, so too the Pope holds the keys in a sense in which the other bishops don't. It, it, it transfers. How, how do we know? Matthew 28. The authority, the, the authority there to preach, to, well, I should say to teach, to sanctify, to govern. It's made there in Matthew 28 to the apostles. That authority is unto the end of the age. Not until the death of, of the apostles and it stops with them. It's unto the end of the age. So whatever authority and setup that was going on there with Christ and the apostles prevails and continues into the successors because it's to last until the end of the age. So I wouldn't say that, okay, even if you grant this, you know, somehow it ends with Peter. No. Some of y'all need to read some more, <laughs> some of the Orthodox, like, you know, Meyendorf, uh, you know, on, on the primacy of Peter and, and see what historically Orthodox have said there and then compare it to the letter of the four patriarchs and some Orthodox today and see how major, major the discontinuity is. There's a lot of discontinuity there in orthodoxy. That's why I, I, I tune out in orthodox when they start talking to me about innovation and, you know, uh, lack of uh, agreement on certain theological issues. I, I just, it's a joke. You have the same problem. So why, why the rhetoric? Just drop the rhetoric and let's just talk about the doctrines because you have the same problem. <laughs> What are your thoughts on Jay Dyer's objections against the papacy? What what are his objections? Does he have any objection beyond you guys are clowns and you have clown masses? Does he have anything beyond that? <laughs> well, yeah, I know he appealed to Mortalium Animos and tries to say that there's discontinuity with Vatican II, but I mean that's that's laughable. Right? It's laughable that somehow this invalidates the papacy. Um I would say there, there's not nearly as much discontinuity there as he would like to propose. And I can show more discontinuity in uh, orthodoxy than that. But more importantly, uh, it doesn't disprove the papacy. Clown masses doesn't disprove the papacy. You know, he, he's, he's a rhetorician. That's all he is. What are his arguments? What are the substantial arguments that he offers when you cut through the rhetoric? I don't think he has any. And I think that he knows he didn't have any whenever he was debating Eric on the papacy. And I say debating loosely because it was an informal discussion. Not really a debate. And whenever he was losing and not keeping up in that discussion, he just resorts to rhetoric, straw men, personal attacks. Tries to interrupt. You know, somebody who has something cogent to say doesn't have to resort to those things. They don't. They don't. They would let their arguments speak for themselves. So I would have to ask you, what are those arguments? I don't know. Still waiting to hear. Crickets on my end. I'm not hearing anything but crickets. So I don't know. I'd like to hear more. Uh, if he can offer something substantial, that's great. But I, I can't even, <laughs> before I could even hear what he has to offer and say, I, I would have to get past all of the personal attacks, all of the behavior that he has shown, all of the scandal. I would have to somehow get past that to hear anything he has to say. That's why I've said if some of these people have the truth, I'd never know it by the way they act. I'd never know it because they have become a stumbling block between myself and the truth. If they possess it, which I don't believe they do, but if they do, I wouldn't know. But Hey, maybe uh, if you can show me what those are, I'll listen to you. I'll hear you out. Maybe if you can glean some arguments from them, let me know. Uh, my, Michael, have you considered uh, going on Matt Fred show? 
They discussed it today. I'm I'm definitely open to it. I didn't know that they, they discussed that, but sure. Sure, I'm open to it. I mean, I'd love to talk about the Magisterium, you know, on his show, or the fate of unbaptized infants, something like that. Really, I didn't talk about anything. I'm I'm just talking about those are the subjects I prefer, the ones I'm most interested in, right? You generally want to talk about what you have passion for. Those tend to be what I have a passion for, but I could talk about whatever, you know. Um, but if you want to get me into it, really want to come on, <laughs> uh, you know, have it have it be on one of those. I'll be on Gospel Simplicity's channel in a couple days, uh, January 2nd. Talking about the case for the Magisterium. Um, I think I'll be doing a show or a conference or something like that with Steve Ray on typology and typology of the temple. Love that. I love talking typology and scripture. It's one of my passions. So, um, yeah. Any of those would be fun. <laughs> What's your opinion on the creepy nativity at the Vatican? Uh, <laughs> what are these people thinking? <laughs> that That's my thought. What are they thinking? Really? So you think that somebody's going to see this and they're going to say, you know what? My faith has just been so enriched by this. My relationship with God has just become so much stronger. My appreciation for the incarnation is just so deep now. Thank you. <laughs> what, what do you expect people? To, what, what kind of reaction are you looking for when you put that crap up? I mean, seriously? It, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of hippie do you have to be to put that nativity kind of scene up? I don't know. I I've, I feel like, you know, this was by, this was made by a hippie. I feel like that. I mean, I, I don't know who else would have come up with this concept. <laughs> when I saw that, I just had to, I had to laugh. I mean, how, how can you take this seriously? All right. Um, it, it's scandalous. It, it's ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous to the point that we should be laughing at the people who did that. They they rightly deserve to be laughed at and mocked, if you ask me. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's what I think of it. Um, the Pope alleys with leaders around the world to build back better and aligns himself with straight up evil. How do we reconcile uh, this to potential converts? Are we being trolled? <laughs> I like that last part. Are we being trolled? <laughs> yeah, look, it's a legitimate question, right? I mean, how, when the state of the church is so bad, I mean, how do you evangelize people? I would, I would ask you this question. How would you evangelize somebody uh, while Christ was being crucified, if you were there at Calvary. Okay. How would you tell the Jews, let's say you're John standing right next to Mary, watching the crucifixion, and you got all these Jews around laughing in Jesus, making fun of them. How are you going to walk up to the Jews over there and tell them, hey, he really is the Messiah. He really is the son of God. You shouldn't be doing that. You should receive his message. It's a pretty tough sell, isn't it? <laughs> But at the same time, does it mean that we shouldn't do it? No. Does it mean that our message is false? No. Does it mean it's very hard to see in the current crisis? Yeah, it was very hard to see that on Calvary. The apostles were scandalized. The apostles, except John, fled. And they were really depressed and down after the crucifixion. Until they saw Christ resurrected, they, they really were lacking there in belief. Struggling with their belief. Uh, I would say the same is the case today. So, how do we do it? Appeal to ultimately, did Christ establish the church? Does the papacy, is the papacy formed by divine institution? If the answer is yes, then you have to become Catholic. If the answer is no, then Please, by all means, consider something other than Catholicism. Don't waste your time. 
please d- do something else by all means. But if it is of divine institution, you don't have a choice but to become Catholic. You can't choose something contrary to God in his will for you. So the question is, is it of divine institution? Don't talk to me about scandals. Don't talk to me about clown masses. Don't talk to me about all that nonsense. Because it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant to the objective question of, is this something divinely established? That, that's where we need to have our discussions. That's where we really need to focus. So I would say, ask that question, search that question out, and you'll have your answer. Uh, will you do some more videos on the Great Reset? Yeah, I, I plan to have uh, Steve Cunningham back on. I think we're going to do another one. Is Vatican II infallible because it uses solemn language? It never uses solemn language. No. <laughs> and as I said at the beginning of the show, the one unique proposition that it offers that is definitive, which is infallible, was issued in a non-solemn fashion. Everything else was ordinary magisterium. So not necessarily infallible. But that's not a, that's not a good question, to be honest with you. That's not, I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong to ask that question. Don't get me wrong. It is a good question in and of itself. Don't get me wrong. Don't, please don't misunderstand me. It's a good question in and of itself. What I'm trying to say is it's not the best way to ask the question. The best thing to ask here is what is the assent that I owe to the Second Vatican Council? That's a better question. It's a better question. What is the assent that I owe to the Second Vatican Council? Not... What did Vatican II teach that's infallible so that as long as it's not infallible, I don't have to adhere to it? Not saying that's what you believe, you know, whoever asked the question. Not saying that that's what you believe. I'm just saying that when people normally ask me that question, that's generally where it's coming from. But if that's not where it's coming from with you, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not trying to single you out. I'm talking more about people who had asked me that question and they're coming from that perspective of, well, unless it's infallible, I don't have to believe it. That's kind of what I'm trying to get at here. Uh, so it's a, it's a good question overall, but I would like to ask different questions at this point. Um, honestly, beyond the intellectual arguments, the best apologetic online for Catholicism are the peacefulness and charitability of converts who don't bear a bitter polemic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Compare that to some of your other Orthodox comforts, by the way. <laughs> I keep picking on Orthodox today. Um, I love Orthodoxy in, in so many ways. I love especially its liturgy. Um, and there are many, many good Orthodox that I love. Um, it's just the converts in the United States and the West tend to be the toxic ones. Uh, but not all. I mean, there there are some good converts in the West. Don't Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not all of them. It's just talking about trends and tendencies here. They tend to be the ones that if they're a convert, avoid them, (laughs) you know, you're just going to get nothing but vitriol from them. Uh, Let's see if there's anything else. Is the concept of communion on the tongue as ancient as we would like to believe? Such a good question. I was just having that conversation the other day. The concept of communion on the tongue and the concept of communion on the hand are old, ancient. Um, communion on the tongue in some places was preferred at, at different points. Communion on the hand in other places was preferred. Um, it it really just kind of depends from what I've seen. You really can't insist on either. Both practices were allowed. In some cases, there were times where communion on the hand was preferable in the first millennium. I think if done rightly, it's fine and it's safe. If done rightly, 
Uh, the problem today is it's generally not done rightly. That that's the problem, you know. So I, I I'm not opposed to communion on the hand per se, because then you're going to have a really hard time with the first millennium. I'm more opposed to the way in which it's done. Uh, it's done irreverently, and one is not mindful of particles of the host that still remain on their hand, and you know. It's just done flippantly. It's done in a lot of cases. It's done with a lack of reverence, you know. Uh, but that doesn't mean that communion in the hand is wrong. It means that the way in which we're doing it is is wrong, right? Um, if you ask me which one I think is more apostolic or ancient, probably say communion in the hand. I think that has a better case for it. Um, but I mean, if you could prove that communion on the tongue was apostolic too, that's fine. Or you, if you could prove, prove that communion on the tongue alone was apostolic, it's fine too. I'm fine either way, as long as we're doing it properly. Right. Um, but really I prefer the orthodox way of receiving communion. So I would, I would just say that, you know, um, you know. Uh, I think the Eastern approach is a little bit better. Although intinction is, is not, you know, is not a bad way to do it. If, if done properly, I've seen it done improperly. <laughs> Scares me. Told y'all before I've have some horror stories of when I was an extraordinary minister of Holy communion and, uh, somebody sloshed or spilled the, Precious blood is just, you know, very, very tragic. So, anyways, uh, let's see if there's any other questions here. Not a set or SSPX, but hypothetically, could a valid uh, pope ever be the Antichrist, assuming the Antichrist will be an individual? I would say no, but there are prophecies that Rome... Uh, you know, might become the seat of the Antichrist and Rome will apostatize. That doesn't mean the Pope of Rome will become the Antichrist and apostatize, right? Just means Rome, the people, the city, right? Doesn't necessarily mean the Pope himself. And I would say the Pope himself, no, I think that that's excluded. I, I don't see how to line that up with the uh, Petrine promises. I, I if you have some way to square that one, I'll hear it out. I just don't see it. Uh, as long as someone doesn't adopt a schismatic mindset or attitude towards the church and Pope, isn't it reasonable for them to attend masses at their local SSPX chapel? You know, I'm not opposed open, you know, in, in some cases for a person to attend an SSPX chapel, but it's more on a case by case basis that I would, feel comfortable recommending it you know um i'd have to find out like you know what what kind of parishes do you have available in your area what what state are they in and what kind of effect are they having on you as opposed to you attending a, a sspx parish um and its effects on you i would have to talk to the individual and find out where they're at you know if there's a good uh parish nearby that's diocesan um, and is not having a detrimental effect on the person's soul when they attend the liturgy, I would recommend that over the SSPX. But if somebody's attending a mass, it is just, <laughs> you're worse off spiritually when you leave that place than when you came. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you might want to consider an SSPX chapel at that point. Uh, it just really depends on who you are, what your situation is. I, you know, I'd have to find out more. So I, I, I wouldn't be able to give just a blanket answer on that one. What do you think about theories that the church is the harlot church of Revelation? Well, if you look at it, um, you know, the whore of Babylon there could refer to Rome or it could refer to Jerusalem. Um. But if you're going to take the approach that it refers to Rome instead of Jerusalem, okay, it's talking about secular Rome, 
pagan Rome, right? It's not talking about Christian Rome. So I don't care if you say it was Rome. It's pagan Rome. That's fine. What does that have to do with the Catholic Church? Nothing. It's entirely irrelevant. So even if somehow you proved it wasn't Jerusalem, it's Rome. Okay, you've proven pagan Rome is the whore of Babylon. Congratulations. That has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. Thank you. Moving on. Good question, though. But that's why, like, you know, guys like Dave Hunt and their whore of Babylon video is just like, it's just, you wasted all that time to prove something that is irrelevant to the Catholic Church. But okay. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else coming up in the chat? I'm looking. Um, trying to see. Well, I see Vatican Catholic being promoted in the chat. Oh, somebody gagged me. Can a minor bishop in Eastern Orthodoxy validly declare patriarchs anathema? Well, I did a show on that the other day, didn't I? <laughs> can they? No. Um, not, not. I don't see how they could do that canonically. First of all, for, the, for a Catholic, we, we have a canon against that. Our Eighth Ecumenical Council prohibits that. Um, now, I recognize that our eighth council is not accepted by an Orthodox. So I get that, but, um, but you're asking about an Orthodox Bishop, Eastern Orthodox Bishop there. So, yeah, um, I still don't see it. I still don't see it, uh, for the Orthodox position, but I mean, Hey, if you, you can maybe show me some canons that would back that up, I'd like to see it, but I think you'd be challenged by some other rival canons that might, you know, indicate otherwise. So, um, I'm open to it, but I just don't see it. So <clears throat> we'll understand corrected though. Timothy Gordon said in the catechism, Pius X has similar wording regarding Muslims as no, Nostra Aetate, which I think Nostra Aetate and also Lumen Gentium, by the way, is this true? Yes, it is true. Good question. <clears throat> uh, if you could give a Protestant Orthodox one Western spiritual work, what would it be? Uh, oh, a Protestant or an Orthodox. Gotcha. Thomas Akempis, Imitation of Christ. Bestseller in Russia <laughs> for the Orthodox. So don't tell me it's not <clears throat> going to resonate with the Orthodox. <laughs> uh, let's see. If there's any others. Otherwise, I'm going to kill the stream. Um, if I'm missing it, go ahead and send it. Again, because I'm not seeing it, uh, but you better send it soon. Give it about five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Going once, going twice. Okay, I don't see any more, so we'll end it there. I appreciate y'all watching. Thank you for participating there in the chat. Uh, oh, one last one. Okay, here. What what power does the state have over the Episcopate? Yeah, good, good question. In fact, we had, you know, Dr. Rowan where we're uh, talking about this, but what power does the state have over the Episcopate? Um, I can't think of what power the state has over the church in any fashion. So I would answer none. But if I'm wrong about that, please help me help me understand where I've erred. I'd like to hear more. Uh, is there any devotion you don't feel comfortable with? Uh, some of the devotions that are just, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying they're wrong, but I, I think sometimes some of the Marian devotions can get a little too, you know, I, and I know the response is going to be, uh, what it would be, but I think some of the Marian devotions end up, um, detracting from, uh, worship of Christ I know the answer is going to be, you know, no amount of veneration for Mary could ever uh, detract from that because Mary leads us to the Son. I, I get that, but we, in reality, we know that's not true. Uh, in reality, we know that's definitely not true in some of the Latin American countries, so please don't give me that. Um, but I'd, I'd give Mary the highest honors, obviously, and, and I, I love the Virgin Mary and have a great 
devotion to her. Anyone who blasphemes her in the channel, they're out. Uh, I'd probably punch somebody if they blasphemed the Virgin Mary in front of me. So I have a great deal of devotion to the Virgin, but at the same time, I'm going to try to keep things in perspective and um, put the focus on Christ um, ultimately. Now, again, I'm not saying someone is wrong. And so, I mean, I don't know. I'm still torn on that one. <laughs> um, as, you know, some of the other ones I just still more, I guess I would, I would just say I have reservations about, I would have questions about, I'm not opposed to them. I'm just a little reserved. Let, let's just put it that way. Um, what do you say to those that the devotion to the sacred heart is Nestorian? I say that they're ridiculous. They're ridiculous. <laughs> I've heard this so many times. Oh man. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I kind of get the feeling that some people who make these arguments is because the, they just learned what the term Nestorianism is and they just read about it in history and they're really excited about the term and they want to show people, they want to show off their knowledge. So they start looking for a million and one instances in which something might be Nestorian when in reality it has absolutely nothing to do with Nestorianism. And they call it Nestorian just so that they can show off that they know what the term Nestorian means. I, I almost get that impression. <laughs> I, d I don't know where some of this comes from. It's ridiculous. And obviously we're not talking about a devotion to the heart muscle, right? So please, please spare me of this rhetoric. Uh, we're, we're not talking about devotion to a heart muscle. Um, is there any others? I think I may have saw one. Hmm. What do you want to debate the most and about what? That's a really good question. Hmm. Uh, what would I want to debate that I haven't already debated? Because I, the fate of unbaptized infants is probably the thing I'd, I'd like to debate the most, but I've already had two debates on it. But um, that would be the answer. But again, I, I've already had some debates on it, so I don't know if that's what you're asking. Uh, what What is your take on the CDF's recent note on the COVID-19 vaccines? That, that's a good question. In fact, I meant to do a segment on that today, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, you know, look, the the issue of remote cooperation and evil is nothing new. The The Catholic Church has taught this for ages. And uh, the Orthodox sure afford that. So I, I don't know why some Orthodox are up in arms about this. Uh, they should look at themselves. Um, and it's absolutely impossible to, you know, avoid a remote cooperation in evil in today's society. I, I don't know how you could ever tr make any kind of transaction or I, <laughs> you know, own a 401k or something. Um, I, I, or even a basic checking account. <laughs> I, I don't know how you could avoid a remote cooperation in this day and age. Um, so my issue is not with remote cooperation. It's obviously with proximate cooperation. That's clearly sinful. So uh, I don't have an issue with what they're, they're saying there, uh, the CDF. Um, and, and they're explicitly clear that's not a promotion of abortion. So I think people are up in arms for the wrong reasons. All right. Well, that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and end it there. I appreciate y'all's uh, interaction there in the comments. Um, thank y'all for watching. And uh, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Also, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us. Until next time, God bless.